Okay, thank you. Thank you so much to Professor Grayson for that introduction. Thank you to Hebrew Union College and to the Cloud Library for generously and graciously hosting our workshop this week and my talk today. And thanks to all of you who have joined um, both in person and online for the opportunity to study together. I hope I'll live up to, um, to the expectations that have just been set. So. <laughs> um, since I'll be speaking today about Jewish women and the rabbinic establishment in medieval Ashkenaz, and since I subtitled my talk, A View from the Courtroom, I'd like to begin with the following vignette. Around the turn of the 14th century, a man called Reuben appeared in the court of two local judges named Rabbi Jacob and Rabbi Colonimus, claiming that his daughter-in-law, here called Leah, had seized his books and refused to relinquish them. Leah conceded that she had appropriated the volumes, but insisted excuse me, oops, that she had taken them in lieu of her dowry, which Reuben owed her. Indeed, she had already sold the books in order to buy food and basic necessities. Reuben maintained that he had transferred Leah's entire dowry to his son, but Leah contended that he should have handed the funds directly to her or to a reliable third party, as her husband was an imbecile and not capable of handling money. <laughs> the case became even more colorful as Reuben proceeded to register a second claim against Simeon, Leah's relative, who had abetted her in removing the books from Reuben's home. Like Leah, Simeon conceded the charge, but insisted that he was merely helping his relative who could not contend physically with the very large and heavy volumes. Leah, he explained, had lifted the books from their places, thereby establishing ownership, or in this case, theft, and he had simply carried them out the door and deposited them in her father's abode. It appears that the real, that Leah's real goal in purloining her father's, her father-in-law's property and engineering this showdown was to force her husband, who was mentally ill, to grant her a divorce before he became too incapacitated to do so. In the next stage of the courtroom drama that unfolded, Leah explicitly demanded a divorce. And although her own words were not recorded, the re-rendered version of her statement is in itself compelling. And I'll read here from the slide. And what she claims, that her husband is insane and that his idiocy increases with every passing day, and she asks that he divorce her before he becomes completely insane and she is chained to him forever, and also lest she have children and he is unable to support her. And her father was destitute, and in his desperation he married her to this man, and she thought that she would be able to accept it, but she is not able to accept it because he is entirely mad. And she fears that he may kill her in his anger, for when he is irritated, he hits and kills and throws things and kicks and bites. Now, Reuben rejected this characterization of his son, maintaining that he was not mad or violent, just unskilled in the ways of the world. And he was adamant that there had been no deception, as Leah was aware of his son's nature before she agreed to marry him. And the responsa goes on to uh, record that Reuben responds, you knew him in advance, and thus you considered it and accepted it. And furthermore, he is not mad, just unskilled in the ways of the world. And he will not divorce you, unless you return the books or their monetary value and then he will divorce you. But tellingly, Leah's husband played no role in any of these exchanges. And both she and her father-in-law seemed to assume that he was indeed incapable of litigating and would do as his father told him. The local court was unsure how to deal with Leah, who presented compelling arguments, even as she admitted wrongdoing. And they referred the case to Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, otherwise known as the Rosh. Uh, he lived from about 1250 to 1327 and was a prominent student of Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rottenberg, one of the great legal authorities of the late 13th and early 14th centuries. Rabbi Asher introduced the, uh, instructed excuse me, the judges to gather more information. Were there witnesses to Leah's break-in? Did the original betrothal agreement stipulate that Leah herself was to receive her dowry? But on the matter of divorce, he was adamant. Insanity was not one of the five defects listed in the Mishnah as reasonable grounds for forcing a husband to divorce his wife. And therefore, Leah could try to appease her husband, or she could make peace with her situation, but the court would not compel the man to divorce her. This vignette and Rabbi Asher's ruling have caught the attention of legal scholars and historians alike, who have taken them as evidence of social and legal attitudes toward mental illness in general and specifically as grounds for divorce. But the anecdote has another significance, 
that is usually overlooked. It is first and foremost a record of litigation in a medieval Jewish setting and a representation of 13th or perhaps early 14th century women and men's interactions with the law and the local Jewish justice system. As such, it conveys valuable information about medieval people's knowledge of the law, their attitudes towards the mechanism of justice, and their expectations of the court as a, courts as a venue for managing conflict and resolving disputes. As a witness to mental illness in the Middle Ages, Leah and her husband's story is a sad one indeed. But as a witness to the history of medieval litigation, it's the tale of an independent and resourceful woman who tried to use the tools at her disposal to control her own fate, even if in this case she did not succeed. It's worth noting that Leah did not bring her case directly to the courts, but first tried to achieve her ends through other means, and parenthetically, it seems safe to assume that breaking into her father-in-law's home was probably not her first attempt to obtain the divorce either. Yet Leah was clearly an astute litigant who made cogent arguments that confounded the judges enough to require consultation with an authority like Rabbi Asher, despite her incriminating behavior and free admission of misconduct. One of the ongoing challenges for scholars like myself who study pre-modern Jewish history is accessing the voices, and thus the stories, the perspectives, the histories, of people who did not author texts, and thus did not leave a very obvious or pronounced trace in the historical record. Most of the sources that historians have used to write the traditional accounts of medieval Jewish history are scholarly texts like Talmud commentaries, rabbinic responsa, and other halachic works, as well as chronicles, piyutim, philosophical tracts, moralistic works, and more, all of which were written by an elite group of learned and often well-connected and well-respected men. While these texts do reference and allude to the existence of other groups of people, including the non-learned, the non-well-connected, the poorer, the disabled, and otherwise marginalized individuals of medieval Jewish society, they cannot usually offer a direct glimpse into the lives and experiences and concerns of those who did not write them. Women, although they were hardly a minority in the numerical sense, constitute one of these groups of people. The challenge of finding and hearing Jewish women's voices in the pre-modern era is actually more acute than the challenge of locating pre-modern Christian women's voices, for example, because for various reasons, Jews did not have a tradition of female mystics or nuns or religious scholars who left the occasional text for historians of medieval Christian Europe to work with. Practically speaking, that is, we have virtually no texts written by European Jewish women prior to the 17th century. The situation is slightly better for the Islamic East, where we can hear Jewish women's voices in dozens of personal correspondences and business letters and lists and other documents that have been preserved in the famous Cairo Geniza, a treasure trove of Hebrew and vernacular texts of all kinds from the medieval and early modern periods, which we heard about yesterday in such eloquence and depth from Professor Eve Krakowski. But those of us who study the, tech, the Jews of medieval Europe are left struggling to locate and hear female voices, which are critical not only to writing the history of women, but to writing a balanced and non-elitist history of Jewish life in general during this period. I want to thank our colleague, Professor Rena Lauer, who spoke to the HUC community yesterday in a webinar that was sponsored by our workshop and the Jewish Language, Languages Project about the ways in which Jewish women's wills can provide access to pre-modern Jewish women's voices and intentions. But I also want to reiterate what she herself noted, that unfortunately there are to date no known Jewish women's wills that have survived from the region and era that I study, that is from the northern European German-speaking lands of medieval Ashkenaz. And so I want to turn our attention to another genre of sources that can serve as a potential corrective. Historians of medieval and early modern Europe at large have long argued that criminal and civil trial protocols, canonization hearings, and inquisition records are among the richest sources for the lives of women and other groups of people who did not author texts of their own. Although court records are constructed documents that do not offer direct access to the voices of those who showed up in the courtroom, and we'll talk more about that, they do nonetheless provide what is often the closest contact we can get 
with otherwise silent historical actors. In my own research in medieval European Jewish history, and attempts to locate some of these silent actors within medieval Jewish communities, I, followed the lead, I have followed the lead of some of the aforementioned historians and paid particular attention to the records of medieval Jewish law courts. One of my conclusions is that the courtroom is a good place to find medieval Jewish women, and that records of litigation in Jewish courts offer us unparalleled access to women's voices. I'd like to share some of those sources with you today to highlight the context in, that, in which they feature women and capture women's voices and to discuss what they can teach us about how we can or even should use the sources we have to reconstruct the history of medieval Jewish life, women included. But first a little bit of background just to orient everyone to the time, place, and kinds of sources we'll be looking at. Throughout the medieval period, Women appeared in the Jewish courts of Northern Europe as plaintiffs, defendants, and occasional witnesses in cases that pertained to a wide array of business matters, family altercations, and other legal affairs. Scores of cases recorded in the responsa literature in which women used or manipulated the courts to resolve marriage, inheritance, personal injury, and financial disputes with men and with other women demonstrate that women in medieval Ashkenaz were active consumers, let's call them, of the law. Although they were barred from the bench and officially disqualified as witnesses in accordance with Talmudic strictures, and although they were additionally limited in their financial independence and legal liability if they were married, these women nonetheless chose to submit their disputes for adjudication before Jewish courts, and they expected to obtain justice and redress. Significantly, as we will see, the responsa and other sources portray women as autonomous actors who participated in the legal culture of the communities in which they lived, engaging with the justice system in a manner that was confined neither to passive roles nor to matters that pertain to them specifically as women, such as marriage and divorce. Just a word about time and place. Um, this is a map of the Jewish settlements in the, uh, what's known as the medieval German Empire around the year 1200. Um, this number of settlements gets significantly larger as we move through the 13th century and into the 14th century. Um, so when I speak of Ashkenaz, um, Ashkenaz can mean different things to different people at different uh, times in history. But for my purposes, um, for the period that we are going to be talking about, I am referring to the German-speaking lands of the medieval German Empire, of which this is a rough um, snapshot. Um, for some historians, Ashkenaz includes northern France, um, as well as sometimes England. Um, those are going to be out of the purview of my particular focus um, without getting into the particulars of exactly why. Um, as far as time period is concerned, um, when I speak of the high medieval ages, um, the high Jewish Middle Ages, um, I refer, and other historians, we're referring roughly to the time between the First Crusade, so 1096, and the time of the Black Death um, in 1347, 48, 49. Um, so we're talking about that period of roughly 250 years. Um, and all the sources that we're going to be discussing today are drawn from that time and that place. Now, the only surviving court records from medieval Ashkenaz are fragments, like the story of Leah and her father-in-law that you heard that were preserved within the rabbinic responsa of the era. Um, and I've used this word a few times already. Um, when I speak of responsa, I am, of course, referring to the correspondence between rabbinic authorities um, concerning difficult or unprecedented applications of halakha that functioned and continue to function within the Jewish legal corpus as a type of case law. We have very few of the protocols, witness depositions, notarized receipts or other documentation that the Cairo Geniza and some European municipal archives have yielded in such abundance. And we have none of the Pinkasim or community notebooks that have provided such rich portraits of Jewish courtrooms in early modern German, Germany and France. That's in part the result of unfortunate historical circumstances that plagued the Jews of medieval Europe. The attacks, expulsions, dislocations, natural disasters, that led to the destruction of many records. But it's also to a very large extent because unlike the Jewish courts of Egypt, of Spain and Italy, 
and later of Poland. And unlike most secular and ecclesiastical courts across medieval Europe, the Bate Din, or Jewish courts of medieval Ashkenaz, did not employ official scribes, notaries, or witnesses, and seemingly kept very few official records. In brief, the Jewish court system during this period was comprised both of fixed expert courts that were staffed by learned authorities, as well as by ad hoc, sometimes known as borerim panels, that were made up of laymen who were called in to mediate disputes between various parties. Prior to the 15th century, the Jewish courts in Ashkenaz did not regularly and systematically write down the claims of the litigants who appeared before the bench, or even the rulings of the judges. The responsa themselves suggest that written records were created mainly when multiple litigants presented complex arguments that the judges were afraid to forget, or when litigants, excuse me, when litigants wanted to consult an outside authority or to challenge the ruling of the court that initially heard their case. These records were forwarded to outside authorities like Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, who we heard before, and they have largely been preserved in the responsa that were later issued by those scholars. Yet in many instances, like that of Leah and her father-in-law, the courtroom narratives preserved in the responsa are second and sometimes even third-hand renditions of the facts and arguments that were heard in the original courtrooms. As the respondents did not reproduce the records that had been forwarded them to them by the local courts, but merely summarized them in their own words before issuing their analyses and rulings. Now, this practice, unfortunately, makes it very difficult to access the voices of the litigants who populated the courts of medieval Ashkenaz. Nevertheless, as I said previously, taking the lead from historians of medieval and early modern Europe, I still contend that the court narratives that are embedded within the rabbinic responsa are among the richest sources we have for the lives of women and other classes of people who did not author texts of their own or leave much trace in the official register. The challenge, of course, is how to tease meaningful information out of the formulaic and reconstructed material that we do have. So now to give you a sense of what I mean, let's start with a case that was referred to Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rottenberg sometime in the second half of the 13th century. Much, although by no means all, of the litigation involving women in the Jewish courts of medieval Ashkenaz pertained, as we've already seen, to issues of marriage and divorce. A subset of these categories, which is a little bit of background that's necessary for understanding the case here, a subset of these, uh, of these cases related to yibum, that is the biblically-based leveret marriage that required a widow whose husband had, had died without producing offspring to marry his brother and produce offspring in the dead man's name. Now, although yibum was practiced in medieval Ashkenaz throughout the 13th century, halachic authorities increasingly preferred chalitza, um, that is the divorce-like alternative ceremony that released the widow from the biblically mandated marriage to her brother-in-law. In many cases of this nature, the procedure presumably went off without a hitch, but the ones that have left traces behind in the historical register are, of course, the cases in which widows found themselves battling their brothers-in-law over the future of their relationship itself. In brief, a widow who refused three months after her husband's death either to marry the lever or to perform chalitza was deemed a rebellious wife, and as such she forfeited her ketubah and all claims to her husband's estate with the exception of her original dowry. On the other hand, a lever who refused to perform either yibum or chalitza was considered a recalcitrant husband and threatened with, uh, with uh, corporal punishment, and even excommunication. Um, but the choice between these two was usually left to the man, and a widow who did not ma wish to marry her brother-in-law was dependent on his compliance and goodwill. As long as he was willing to perform yibum, the judges and scholars they consulted were reluctant to compel chalitza. And so a widow who per persisted in her refusal to marry her brother-in-law regardless of whether he was already married to another woman, significantly older or younger than herself, unhealthy, bad-tempered, otherwise undesirable, could find herself subject to extortion and manipulation backed by the law. So what we have before us here is one case that was referred to Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rotenberg during the second half of the 13th century, where the lever called Reuben, 
believed that his sister-in-law had seized too much of his dead brother's property, assets that were worth more than the value of her ketubah. And consequently, he refused to perform Khalitza until she paid him 20 zikukim. By the way, the grounds for Reuben's claim are never specified, and it's impossible to know whether this uh, accusation was justified. In any case, the widow agreed to pay him the money, and in the presence of an official court, they officially forgave one another all past and future claims concerning the estate, marking their agreement with a formal act of acquisition. Now, when the two returned to the court to perform chalitza, to perform the ceremony of chalitza, the widow handed these 20 zikukim to a trusted uh, individual, to a trustee, in the presence of the judges. The lever, the man, asked the trustee whether he would hand over the money after he, the lever, had performed the chalitza, and the trustee said he would. But in spite of all these procedural assur assurances, immediately following the chalitza ceremony, the widow whipped out her ketubah, took an oath to back her renewed allegation that she had not received her due, and demanded that the money be returned to her. As was to be expected, the lever protested, and the case was forwarded to Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rothenburg. Strikingly, Rabbi Meir actually accepted the widow's claim and the validity of her legal maneuver, and he awarded her those 20 zikukim that she had placed earlier in the hands of the trustee. And I want to take a look at his words. This is part of his legal logic, his legal reasoning here. If, she said to the trustee in the presence of the three of them, give him those 20 zikukim after he performs chalitza for me, then surely the trustee must give them to him, for she acquired them on his behalf in the presence of three to give them to him immediately after the chalitza. And after that, she can't take out her ketubah document and swear and collect her ketubah payment. But if she did not say to the trustee, give him, rather she just silently gave those 20 zikukim, then behold, those 20 zikukim were always hers, and they did not really leave her possession. And therefore, even though the trustee said, perform chalitza for her and I will give you the 20 zikukim, the yabam, that is the lever, did not acquire them. For on what basis would he have acquired them? On the basis of a mere statement, he didn't acquire them. Certainly here, where the yabama, in fact, did not say anything, rather the trustee said he would give them to him, that is the yabam, from her property. And he signs it, you know, greetings, Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rottenberg. Now, for those of us who are interested in using these sources to understand women's agency and the effectiveness, their effectiveness within the rabbinic legal system, this source raises many questions, particularly because of its unexpected and unusual outcome. First and foremost, did the widow devise this crafty scheme on her own? The anonymous correspondent who forwarded this case to Rabbi Meir was probably a member of the court in question. And he portrayed the widow acting alone, making no mention of a representative or other legal counsel. Because this was a chalitza case and the woman had a ritual role to play in the ceremony, we can safely assume that the woman herself was indeed present in the courtroom. But it's hard to know whether the widow had been coached by friends and relatives or even by the judges themselves, whether she was simply lucky that her claim carried legal weight, or whether she herself was sufficiently familiar with the law to know how she might work the system to her advantage. Most widows, I will say, were not so lucky. Now, let's take a look at another colorful dispute from the mid-13th century that is not about marriage or divorce at all, but instead features two Jewish businesswomen to take this question one step forward. Here, a woman called Rachel came before a Jewish court to sue her business partner, Leah, for the loss of merchandise, specifically two bolts of material and a belt, that she had commissioned her to sell at fixed prices. Leah disputed the purported value of the merchandise, but also claimed that the goods had been stolen from her along with some property of her own and were therefore no longer her responsibility. Then Leah herself turned to the court to sue Rachel for financial loss that was caused by the latter's slander. In the words of the judges who forwarded this case to a recognized authority for consultation, and Leah returned and claimed against Rachel. You caused me to lose three quarters of a mark, for non-Jews also gave me items to sell. And when I told them 
I lost theirs with mine, I would thereby have availed myself of them. But instead, you came and shouted in front of all my neighbors and said, that merchandise was stolen. But that, you claim that merchandise was stolen, but that's not the case. Rather, you kept them for yourself and just said they were stolen. And then, yeah, the neighbors went and told those non-Jews. And they came to me and said, your people say that you yourself are holding the merchandise, although you claim it was stolen. And as a result, I had to compensate them. Right? So she's accusing her of slander. And Rachel responds, no such thing occurred. In other words, Leah claimed that as a result of Rachel shouting her grievances in the hearing of her neighbors, Leah's non-Jewish clients demanded compensation for their own missing merchandise, although they had previously been willing to forgive the loss. Rachel, as you may have gathered, denied involvement. And the anonymous author of the responsum in which this altercation is recorded ruled that as a commissioned agent of sale, or a shomeret sachar, Leah was responsible for the missing items, regardless of what happened to them, and that her accusation of slander was not sufficiently substantiated. As usual, we don't know whether this ruling was enforced or how the dispute ultimately ended. Nonetheless, this case is instructive in terms of how lay people acquired legal knowledge and learned to use it to their advantage in future disputes and interactions with the justice system. Not only does it showcase Jewish women and their expectations of the law, it also captures an evocative cultural exchange and transfer of legal knowledge between neighbors and business associates that occurred, by the way, not inside the courtroom, but on the streets of a 13th century German town. Leah, whose knowledge of Jewish law seems to have been rudimentary and mistakenly informed by what she knew of local law, was nonetheless convinced that she knew not only how her non-Jewish clients would have responded, but how the local non-Jewish justice system would have responded as well. According to Leah, in a later stage of the dispute, local law would absolve her of responsibility for her client's stolen merchandise when she too sustained the loss, as long as she took an oath to that effect. The anonymous author of this responsum did, um, uh, was not convinced excuse me, by Leah's argument, but he did not dispute Leah's claim about the protocols of local justice. He merely pointed out that there was no telling how the law would translate into practice and whether the local non-Jewish justices would not come up with some excuse or loophole to make her pay regardless. Fascinatingly, this halachic scholar suggested that Leah should have been more insistent in resisting her client's demands, explaining to them that a single witness, that is, Rachel shouting her allegations, does not hold weight in Jewish law, and that they would need to prove their allegations before they could extract payment. Indeed, she should have gone with them to the non-Jewish courts, he said, in the hopes that she would prevail. Given Leah's apparent familiarity with local law and custom, as well as her conviction that she would have fared better in that forum, it's noteworthy that she nonetheless chose to submit her court to the Jewish, her, her claims to the Jewish court, even at, at when she was, uh, excuse me, when she was disputing with a business associate and co-religionist. There's a lot to be said about why medieval Jews chose to litigate in the Jewish courts, and perhaps we can discuss some more of that in the Q&A if it interests you. Let me state simply for now that despite the repeated claims of many scholars in the field, Jewish litigants in medieval Ashkenaz like Leah did not litigate exclusively in the Jewish courts. They turned to local non-Jewish courts not only to resolve disputes with Christian neighbors and business associates, but also to adjudicate disputes with fellow Jews. The halachic literature makes it clear, as do local archival records. And therefore, when Jewish litigants like Rachel and Leah did turn to Jewish courts, as opposed to the other judicial forums that were available to them, we should be asking ourselves why. In the case of female as well as male litigants, I would argue that the strongest incentives for choosing the Jewish courts were often social and familial pressures, financial prudence, as well as basic accessibility and personal connections. Now, as I move towards the end of my talk, I'd like to circle back to some of the challenges I discussed at the outset about accessing women's voices. As I noted, the responsa we have been reading are constructed legal discussions. And they compel, ourselves, they compel us to ask ourselves how much such literary representations can actually tell us about the ability of medieval Ashkenazi women to negotiate the legal arena and use the law effectively. To take a stab at this, let's return to the source with which we began, 
That is, to Leah the book thief, caught in a legal battle with her father-in-law in an attempt to wrest a divorce from her mentally deteriorating husband. This time I'd like to pay even more careful attention to the way in which Leah is depicted in Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel's responsum. Leah, as recalled, presented two claims before the judges, Rabbi Jacob and Rabbi Kalanimus. The first was a defense against Reuben's charge of theft. The second was an appeal for divorce. In neither instance were Leah's actual words preserved. Even if Leah's statements had been recorded faithfully by the local court, in Hebrew translation, we can assume that she was not speaking Hebrew, incidentally, they were obviously refashioned at the hands of Rabbi Asher, who modified them yet again in his response. But even at this double remove from their source, there is significance to these claims, to the form of these claims, and to their presentation. In Rabbi Asher's retelling, Leah's explanation of the infraction that she had committed by breaking into her father-in-law's home echoes the words of the Talmud in Tractate Bava Batra. En didi, en chatvi, vedidi chatvi. Yes, I seized it, but what I seized was mine. Right? And I just want to again take a look at this source that we already saw. What you asked about Reuben, who claimed that his daughter-in-law took books from him, although he does not know her anything, and she responds, in chatvi vedidi chatvi. For he owes me my entire dowry, and I have already sold them to finance food and the rest of my needs. And Reuben claims, etc., etc. Now, in its original context, this claim, in its original Talmudic context, this claim is uttered by an individual who snatched another person's bar of silver and was observed by a single witness engendering a legal conundrum. Had two witnesses observed him, he would be obligated to return the item, regardless of his claim. And had no witnesses observed him, he would be believed and allowed to retain the item, since he could have denied the charge altogether. Casting Leah in the role of this Talmudic snatcher, Rabbi Asher instructed the local judges to determine whether there had been witnesses to Leah's theft and to render their verdict accordingly. Now, it's safe to assume that Leah did not utter these words in Babylonian Aramaic and was similarly unaware of their Talmudic source and its implications. Yet, by transposing her claim into Talmudic terminology, Rabbi Asher did not only provide the judges with source-based guidance, he also rendered Leah's claim intelligible and credible from a halachic perspective. While this doesn't tell us much about Leah's own legal knowledge, it does tell us something important about Rabbi Asher's perception of Leah as a litigant with cogent arguments and supportable claims. Providing Leah with a Talmudic script may have obscured the authenticity of her voice, but it rendered her a credible actor in the medieval Jewish courtroom. By comparison, Leah's second claim sounds strikingly real. As I pointed out previously, Leah's own original words were not preserved in this context either. Nonetheless, Rabbi Asher's rendition of her fear and her desperation and vulnerability in the face of both her husband's mad violence and Jewish law's injustice is evocative and arresting. Rabbi Asher's decision not to translate Leah's second claim into Talmudic parlance, as he did with the first, suggests that perhaps he too was compelled by the pathos of her voice in the record that was forwarded to him by the local judges. But even in this instance, Leah's claim has a scripted quality. Her appeal resonates with several classic Talmudic rationales for divorce. In Rabbi Asher's presentation, Leah's case against her husband touches first upon his affliction and its threat to her future well-being, which echoes a Mishnah and Ketubot, and second upon his inability to support her and any children they might conceive, which, issues, which echoes both the Babylonian Talmud Ketubot as well as the Mishnah in Ketubot. And finally, it is based on her initial belief that she could not tolerate, she could tolerate his condition and subsequent discovery that she could not, which also echoes the Mishnah in Ketubot. Now, whether Leah herself imparted this, the petition in this manner is very hard to ascertain, but it's certainly not inconceivable that she possessed enough legal knowledge and courtroom savvy to know that certain claims carried more weight than others. In medieval courts, as well as modern ones, male and female petitioners 
frequently followed legal scripts. And seasoned or resourceful litigants were surely aware that their chances of success were greater if they adapted their arguments to recognized categories of indictment and defense. The recitation of appropriate legal formulas in the courtroom does not necessarily imply that litigants possessed deep legal knowledge, but it does suggest that they knew how to litigate effectively. Guiding my analysis of the narratives of litigation that appear in the medieval response literature is the assumption that men and women who showed up in medieval Jewish courts were, consciously or not, actors in an arena that functioned according to its own internal cultural rules. In order to act on this stage, or at least to act effectively, they adopted scripts and followed guidelines that accorded with the expectations of that environment. This example, I would argue, as well as the others we have seen, demonstrate that medieval Jewish women were capable and effective litigants in this respect, and moreover, that they were generally perceived and depicted as such by the rabbinic authors who recorded their legal endeavors. Of course, much more work remains to be done with sources such as the ones I have been examining in terms of teasing out the voices of lay women and lay men that lurk behind these rabbinic reformulations. Yet it seems pretty certain that women in medieval Ashkenaz availed themselves regularly of the Jewish justice system, participated actively in the legal cultures, in the cultures of the communities in which they lived, and made their voices heard in the courtroom, in the process influencing not only law in practice, but law for the ages. The further recovery of their voices remains our challenge. Thank you. Is there enough evidence to talk about the socio socioeconomic status of the women whose cases render them worthy of, um, of being sent to higher authorities? Um, and and what, how, how that plays a role in, in whether, whether they're taken seriously or whether they have access to the means to make more cogent arguments because of education or, or those kind of things. And then, and my other question is about, so we talk about Ashkenaz as this one big area. Is there, are there enough documents or enough, um, are there enough examples to kind of suss out different regional differences or, ta or, or town differences in the way that, that um, these cases are handled or, or which places seem to have more interesting cases? Thank you very much for both okay, of those questions. Um, just to recap for the audience online. Um, the first question was about whether we can get any sense of the socioeconomic status of the women who were able to make their cases heard in these courts and to get access to the respondents um, who might have ruled favorably on their behalf. Um, and the second question was about whether we have enough records to be able to um, pinpoint any kinds of regional differences yeah, um, between the different courts. So both are excellent questions. So I'll, I'll address the first one um, first. Um, with regards to the, um, the status of the women. So first of all, yeah, we need to do things like that in order to understand how these courts function, not only for the women, but for the men who use them as well. Um, and here I would point to the, way that, the ways that we can begin to do that sometimes um, are to take a look at, first of all, the, the, the amounts of money that were involved. That gives us a bit of a sense in at least the financial disputes. Um, the, the, the socioeconomic status of the litigants um, who were involved in these cases. Um, but also, I, in my assessment, it seems to me that even more than socioeconomic status, it's the personal family connections that are perhaps among the most critical for these women in terms of getting their cases heard. Um, and there are many cases in which it becomes fairly clear that family connections, that the woman, first of all, that the woman's relatives were oftentimes intensely involved, um, either behind the scenes or not so behind the scenes in these cases. But the ones that I presented today actually strikingly um, present women litigating seemingly alone, although again, we never know who the shadow actors are. Um, but I'll just remind you in that very first case with Leah, right, her relative helped her lift the volumes, right? There were, there were other people certainly involved. 
And sometimes we can really see the family members involved in the sort of negotiations behind the scenes of these cases. Um, and here I would just add, so I think that the family connections were super important in terms of getting, getting the cases heard or getting the responsa that they wanted. Um, and, and yes, we can imagine that socioeconomic status played a role as well. And again, there are different ways that we can try to assess those, um, those various factors. I'll just add here that um, something that I have learned um, from my colleagues who study the Genisa Society, um, something that unfortunately I generally don't have, but has nonetheless been really instructive for me to keep in mind, um, in, in many Genisa cases, um, scholars can show they have multiple genres of documents that refer to the same cases, right? So they can show sort of the behind the scenes that was going on. They have not only the court records, but they also have the personal correspondences um, that were trying to elicit these various responsa and, and you know, move the wheels of justice in different kinds of ways. Now, while I usually don't have those, um, in, the, in a best case scenario, sometimes I'll have multiple responsa that refer to a single case and can therefore provide different perspectives. Um, nonetheless, I always keep that in mind um, because surely that was happening in the world of medieval Ashkenaz as well. And we have to you know, sort of imagine um, those scenarios and fill in uh, the blanks for ourselves even if we can't see it in the written record. Now, with regards to the question about um, regional differences, um, so this is something that scholars have begun to really start playing with a little bit in recent, um, in recent years, um, even in terms of different cities um, and different, I, I should say, different courts in different cities and how um, particular scholars might have you know, exhibited certain patterns of ruling um, or things of that matter to trace, even sometimes how scholars views evolved on particular matters, um, the more that we, you know, sort of um, collate these responsa and, and uh, you know, pay attention to the ways in which they relate to one another or relate to individual scholars and the evolution of their thinking or the ways that they relate to different courts, um, we can try to do that. What's really difficult, and I, I, I should make this very clear, is that most responsa from this era, unfortunately, do not contain explicit information concerning the time and place in which they were written. Right? At, we, sometimes, as in one of the examples that I brought for you, we don't even know precisely who the respondent was. Um, but if we do know who the respondent was, like Rabbi Meir ben Baruch of Rothbard, okay, so we know when he died, so we know what, the, what, the, what the, you know, the final date of its writing could have been, and we know what was happening in the final years of his life, so we can sort of guesstimate. And sometimes we have references to events, or we have references to people, and we can try to narrow down when a particular responsive might have been written, or where a particular responsive might have been written. Um, but we don't always have access to that kind of information, so while that's, you know, a great... Uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that is something that certainly that, that I, I desire as a scholar um, and, and aim for. It's not always possible. But yes, that, that is certainly something that we try to do. About the Geniza and um, some, some uh, material that has been found in the Geniza that uh, seems to have come from Ashkenaz, maybe that could be helpful for getting uh, another perspective on these cases. Um, so first of all, I, I lives, of women. lives of women in general. Yeah, so first of all, I'm, I um, must uh, concede that I am not the Geniza scholar. So um, some of my colleagues sitting right here, including Professor Grayson, would be a better, um, a better would be, be able to better answer that question than myself. Um, but my understanding is that, I mean, that material is valuable, certainly, um, but just how much of, a per, of an additional perspective it gives, on, especially on these kinds of issues, is limited. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, right, we, uh, halavai, as we might say, that we had a Geniza in Ashkenaz um, that, that really provided that kinds of material, the richness of that kinds of, you know, everyday material, which is so valuable for reconstructing these things. Um, so I have two questions. One's kind of structural and one's kind of about like everyday life, I guess. Um, so first I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more. You alluded to the question of like why Jews would go to Jewish courts in medieval Ashkenaz in this context as opposed to non-Jewish courts. Um, and I was just thinking about how messy that political German whatever, Holy Roman Empire political scene is. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about where Jewish courts fit into that. 
Um, and then my second question, just the sort of world and relations evoked in this response. Um, um, so on the one hand, this is somebody whose case is getting heard by a pretty high up rabbi. On the other hand, this is a woman who's sort of been married off to this you know, insane man. And so I guess I'm just wondering if we have any sense of the kinds of life circumstances that might lead to such a, the contracting of such a relationship. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you for both of those questions. The first one had to do with um, Jews' use of Jewish courts, Jews in, in Ashkenaz's use of Jewish courts versus other venues and how, how that whole system worked. Um, and the second question had to do with uh, the circumstances that, that created the, the case that I focused on at the beginning and the end. Um, how did this woman end up getting married uh, or married off um, to, this, uh, you know, to this man who clearly you know, had some problems, um, presumably even prior to their marriage. Um, you know, maybe I'll start with that one, with, with the second question. Um, I think this is a good example of how the responsa provide us just a sort of like enough information to whet our appetite to those kinds of questions. We don't, the responsa doesn't provide an explicit answer to that question. Um, but in between the lines, right, I think we, I mean, again, her father married her off. She did accept the marriage, um, but then upon living with the man realized that she couldn't actually live with the situation. Um, we kind of have to guess as to why that might have happened. My best guess um, is that there were probably financial circumstances involved. Um, this probably was a woman from not a particularly wealthy family, probably a woman um, who was not particularly uh, you know, didn't, didn't have too many options. Um, she seems pretty resourceful, but we don't know what, you know, some of her own family and other circumstances might have been that made her herself um, a difficult match. Um, we also don't know what the relationship between the two fathers were, was, and what, how that might have, you know, factored into why they contracted this marriage between the children. All of those things. I mean, we do know from other cases where there is much more information about how matches were made, and that's actually a topic that we do know a fair amount about from medieval Ashkenaz, um, thanks to many uh, disputes that later arose that made their way into the responsa literature. We can imagine um, a, a multiplicity of different scenarios that might have, um, that might explain why this marriage originally happened. Um, but in the, you know, we can't say with any kind of certainty in this particular case, I don't think. Um, with regard to the question of, uh, of the, court, the different venues, the different legal venues, so one thing um, that perhaps I should have said a little bit more clearly is that the medieval world um, was a world of multiple and overlapping jurisdictions. There was a lot of legal pluralism, and this is true, um, this was true for, I'll speak right now, of medieval Europe um, at large. There were many different court systems that were operating, again, oftentimes in overlapping ways. There were municipal courts, there were ecclesiastical courts, there were market courts, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that all people um, had some kind of um, choice when it came to where to litigate and how to pursue their legal ends. And Jews were no exception. Um, Jewish communities had legal autonomy in particular arenas. They did not have legal, they did not have blanket legal autonomy. Um, for example, Jewish communities did not have the jurisdiction to try criminal cases, most criminal cases as we would call them today. Um, they did have jurisdiction in marriage and divorce cases like this one and in monetary cases um, and in cases of any ritual nature. Um, nonetheless, that doesn't mean that Jews had to go to Jewish courts. Now, if you listen to the, the, the rabbis themselves, um, the rabbis often seem to insist that Jews must, at least um, according to halakha um, and community pressure, go to the Jewish courts, exclusively to the Jewish courts, as opposed to others. Um, yet, we do know, it's very clear in archival records, but also in the responsa itself, and I think one of the one that I gave you is one that we could um, you know, sort of mine further um, in order to prove that, that Jews did often choose to litigate in non-Jewish fora um, against co-religionists and certainly against their Christian you know, neighbors and business partners, et cetera. Um, and there were many reasons why they might have made those kinds of choices. Um, my point, I think, was that we need to ask ourselves, once we know that they have this choice, we need to ask ourselves not only in, when they chose to litigate outside of the Jewish community why they chose to do so, but when they chose to litigate in the Jewish community, um, which was a common choice that many Jews made, once again, why did they choose to do that when they had other options? 
Um, and in the case that we saw, I wanted to point out that, again, this Leia's knowledge of the local law seems to have been um, much more, much, much stronger than her knowledge of the halakhic law. So that might have actually served her better in the local Jewish court. So we need to think about those, those kinds of questions. Um, and for many of the cases that I've seen, it seems to me that oftentimes access, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, family pressures, other kinds of social pressures were often a reason that the, that the Jews ended up in the Jewish courts. Yes? Well, I'll, 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 I'll to that. The question was about um, whether we had, whether you know, what would have happened if two Jews disagreed, two Jewish uh, disputants disagreed as to which court they should submit their case to. Which, by the way, it could have been that they disagreed about which Jewish court to submit their case to, um, but also whether they should submit it to a local court of some nature or a Jewish court, um, and what would have happened, and how would we know about that, etc. Um, so I'll just answer um, uh, briefly in response to that. Um, as I said, the best evidence for Jews going to non-Jewish courts are the local archival material. But um, the response also provides us with super valuable evidence of that nature, in particular because the responsa, any, any responsa that speaks of Jews going to local courts, it only got written because at some point in the altercation they also came to a Jewish court, right? So what it shows us even more than the local, better than the local records, the local archival records might, is the way in which Jews were able to pursue multiple venues at the same time. The way in which they were able to have these fights or to drag their court, you know, sometimes one litigant changed their mind when they saw what kind of um, ruling they got in one court versus the other. The ways in which they were able to really play the system and pursue um, their legal aims in different systems at the same time. Um, oftentimes the disputes that they got into um, one of the layers of the disputes was precisely that, which court they were allowed to go to. Um, usually you can imagine what position the Jewish court took on that matter, um, but that's not necessarily the position that the local court would have taken. 